What are the lost ten tribes of Israel? Israel originally consisted of 12 tribes, but after the death of King Solomon, the ten northern tribes of Israel seceded from the royal house of David and Solomon in Jerusalem and created their own kingdom called the Kingdom of Israel. But the two southern tribes, they continued under the royal house of David and Solomon in Jerusalem and they called their kingdom the Kingdom of Judah. Then prior to and uh, culminating in 721 BC, the Assyrian Empire invaded and deported uh, the northern ten tribes of Israel and settled them in uh, areas of uh, northern Assyria in what today is uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, Iran and Turkey. And we read this in uh, the Old Testament book of the uh, Second Kings. We quote, Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land, and went up to Samaria, and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the, the king of Assyria took Samaria, and carried Israel away into Assyria, and placed them in Hala, and in Hebar, by the river of Gosan, and in the cities of the Medes." Unquote. And that's from 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 5 to 6. And uh, also, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 17, we read, we quote, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Unquote. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Mm. Are the Jews all 12 tribes of Israel? The most common belief both among Christians and among secular people is that the Jews make up all the 12 tribes of Israel. But that belief is incorrect. It was only after the Assyrian invasion and deportation of the northern 10 tribes of Israel that the Bible starts to refer to God's covenant people as Jews. And the reason is very simple. Because after the northern 10 tribes of Israel had been carried away out of the land of Israel, God's covenant people consisted only of the kingdom of Judah, which consisted mainly of the tribe of Judah. And the, the name Jew is of course derived from the name Judah. And that's why in the latter part of the Old Testament and in the first part of the New Testament, uh, the Bible refers to God's covenant people as Jews. When God made covenants with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, God's covenant people was not the Jews, that is Judah, but all the 12 tribes of Israel. It was only after the Assyrian invasion and deportation of the northern 10 tribes of Israel that God's covenant people became synonymous with the Jews. Among modern Jews, there are many who believe that the 10 tribes are not a part of, of the Jewish people, while there are also many Jews who believe they are. One notable Jew who holds the former view is the Orthodox rabbi Shmuley Botich, who was born in 1966, whom Newsweek magazine called the most famous rabbi in America. In his best-selling book, Judaism for Everyone, from 2000, 2002, he wrote, quote, An Israelite is someone who is a descendant of Jacob. After the dispersion of the ten tribes, the Israelites were referred to as Jews, because the remainder of the Jewish nation, those who today form the bulk of the Jewish people, all stem from the tribe of Judah." Unquote. Not only do many modern Jews believe that the ten tribes of Israel are not a part of the Jewish people, but among the Jews of the first and second centuries AD, it was basically a generally accepted belief that the ten tribes of Israel were not a part of the Jewish people, but that they had been separated from Judah many centuries ago, and that they uh, were so far away from the Jews that they had become lost. Flavius Josephus was a leader in the Jewish rebellion against Rome, AD 66-73, but surrendered and became a historian. His books are some of the most quoted sources outside the Bible concerning ancient Israel and the Jews in the first century AD. Josephus writes that the Assyrians deported all the Israelites of the northern kingdom of the ten tribes out of the land of Israel and settled them in Media and Persia. We quote from Antiquities of the Jews, quote, 
When Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, had told him that Hoshea, the king of Israel, had sent privately to Saul, the king of Egypt, desiring his assistance against him, he was very angry and made an expedition against Samaria in the seventh year of the reign of Hoshea. But when he was not admitted into the city by the king, he besieged Samaria three years and took it by force in the ninth year of the reign of Hoshea and in the seventh year of Hezekiah, king of Jerusalem, and quite demolished the government of the Israelites and transplanted all the people into Media and Persia, among whom he took King Hoshea alive. And when he had removed these people out of their land, he transplanted other nations out of Kutha, a place so called, for there is still a river of that name in Persia, into Samaria and into the country of the Israelites. So the ten tribes of the Israelites were removed out of Judea 947 years after their forefathers were come out of the land of Egypt and possessed themselves of this country." Unquote. From Flavius Josephus Antiquities of the Jews. The apocryphal book of Second Esdras is a so-called pseudepigraphic book, which means that it is uh, falsely or wrongly ascribed to Esdra of the Old Testament, also known as Esdras. Scholars believe that uh, Second Esdras was written sometime around the AD 100, but there's also a minority who believe that uh, Jesus quoted uh, numerous times from Second Esdras in the Olivet Discourse recorded in uh, the, the Gospel of uh, Matthew chapters 24 uh, and 25. But uh, regardless of when Second Esdras was uh, writ written, we know that it uh, reflects uh, the uh, mainstream uh, view of the uh, Jews in the first century, or at least a mainstream view of Jews in the first century, because they uh, copied it and we still have it today. Now in the uh, second Esdras there is a passage about the uh, ten tribes of, of Israel and how the Assyrians uh, deported them out of the land of uh, Israel and how they were now living in a uh, distant faraway land. We read. And whereas thou sawest that he gathered another peaceable multitude unto him, those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Hosea the king, whom Salmanasa the king of Assyria led away captive. And he carried them over the waters, and so came they into another land. But they took this counsel among themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt that they might there keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. And they entered into the Euphrates by the narrow passages of the river, for the Most High then shewed signs for them, and held still the flood till they were passed over. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half, and the same region is called Arsareth. Unquote. Second Esdras chapter 13. We therefore see that 2,000 years ago, virtually all Jews believed that the ten tribes of Israel were separate from the Jewish people and were living in uh, a completely different place. So when we look for the lost ten tribes of Israel, we should also look for them outside the Jewish people. Now you might be wondering uh, where we are filming this, and we are filming this in a Roskilde at the Viking Museum. Uh, behind me you see a replica of a Viking ship, uh, the descendants of the Vikings in it, and uh, the water behind me, that is Roskilde Fjord, where the Vikings used to sail in and uh, out of. It was very good for defensive purposes. And uh, the big concrete building uh, behind me, that is the Viking Museum itself, where there are real Viking ships, not just replicas. And now we're going to go in there to take a look at some of the real Viking ships. Assyrian Invasion and Deportation As we have seen, the Old Testament states in a plain language that cannot be misinterpreted that the ten tribes of Israel were deported out of the land of Israel and placed in northern parts of the Assyrian Empire and after 721 BC only the tribe of Judah was left in the land of Israel. Now, individuals of the ten northern tribes stayed with the kingdom of Judah, and individuals of Judah were deported along with the ten tribes. But as tribes, the ten tribes of Israel were removed out of the Holy Land. 
Now, mainstream historians and theologians simply do not know what happened to the Ten Tribes of Israel after that. That is why they are called the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel. Now, di different ethnic groups have been said to be the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel, and some of the most popular candidates are the Pashtuns of Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Lembars of Southern Africa, and various Native American peoples of North America, as well as the peoples of Northwestern Europe and their descendants across the world. Now, we are convinced that the peoples of Northwestern Europe and their descendants across the world are the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel. And we can prove it by lots of circumstantial evidence, which in total means that they are the one and only candidate to be the descendants of the Ten Tribes of Israel. But in this short video, we can only skim the surface. And now, since I'm from Denmark, we're going to start with presenting historical evidence of the Israelite ancestry of the Nordic and German peoples, and then we're going to present evidence of the Israelite ancestry of the peoples of the British Isles, the Netherlands, and France. Asa and Vaner. According to Snorri Sturluson of Iceland, who is also called the father of Nordic history and who lived in the early 13th century, the Nordic peoples of Scandinavia, Iceland and northern, northern Germany came from southern Russia, where they had migrated under a chieftain priest called Odin. Snorri wrote about this in two books, the Yonker Edda from 1220 and the Heimskringla which is also sometimes uh, known as the Chronicles of the Kings of Norway from 1230. Snorri wrote that the ancestors of the Nordic peoples were two tribes called Asa and Wagner. These names are very similar to the names of two of the lost ten tribes of Israel, Asher and Dan. According to Snorri, they lived in a city called Asgard on the river Don, close to what today is the Russian city of Azov. Snorri also wrote that Odin had great estates south of the Caucasus Mountains, which happens to be right next to where the Assyrians had placed the ten tribes of Israel, including Asher and Dan. The greatest Scandinavian historians wrote that Snorri's account that the Nordic peoples came from southern Russia was indeed true. This includes Olaf Rudbeck, the greatest Swedish historian of his age, who wrote his main work at Land Eller Mannheim in the 1690s, and the first decade of the 1700s, and Peter Frederick Sum, the greatest Danish historian of his age, who wrote his main works, such as uh, History of Denmark in the 1770s and 1780s. To get, to get back to Snorri Sturluson of Iceland of the 13th century, the Asa and Vena tribes left Asgard when the Roman general Pompey the Great was fighting King Mithridates of Pontus in the third Mithridatic War in the 70, 70s to 60s BC. It took place in Asia Minor and the Black Sea region, including the Crimea. Now the Crimea borders the Sea of Azov on the east, and on the western side of the Sea of, of Azov is the city of Azov, and possibly the city of Asgard. According to the Danish historian Johannes Bonsted, the ancestors of the Danes arrived to Denmark from the east in two waves, the first shortly after the birth of Christ and the second in the third century. Johannes Bonsted was a capable and respected archaeologist and historian, as well as the director of the National Museum of Denmark. Bonsted wrote this in volume one of uh, Politikens Danmarks Historie, History of Denmark, Politikens Publishers is one of the largest publishers in Denmark, and they also publish the, the liberal newspaper Politiken, which is one of the biggest newspapers in the country. Politiken is something like the New York Times of Denmark. Johannes Bonsted wrote that the ancestors of the modern Danes migrated into Denmark in two waves, one shortly after the birth of Christ and another in the 3rd century AD, and that they came from the region north of the Black Sea and brought along with them the runic alphabet and the rye grain. Now, uh, rye bread is it's the most popular bread in Denmark even today. Quote, Shortly after the birth of Christ, in other words, in the start of the older Roman era, an immigration must have taken place into Denmark of decidedly long skulled people of the Nordic type. It must also be assumed that a new immigration of the same type of people, that is, people of the Nordic type, 
must have taken place in the younger Roman era, probably sometime in the 200s. This way we get a picture, albeit lacking in details, that sometime in the 200s an invasion of Denmark from the east took place. It was a conquest which, which first subdued Sealand, then eastern Funen, and then the advance stopped because the attempt to, com to conquer the western parts of the country failed. By chasing out the Hiroli tribe in the younger Roman era, the Danes got control of, south of the southern regions of the Nordic countries, which became their future homeland, called Denmark. Jordanus, approximately 550, says concerning this place, and he's probably speaking of the Danes, or the Danes, that they claim to be the tallest of all the peoples of Scandinavia. This fits with the anthropological measurings of skeletons from Denmark from the Roman era, which show a rise in the average height of the males. It can therefore not be denied that the thought of the Danes coming to our country sometime in the 200s can find some support both in archaeological and historical sources, even though the latter are both late and scarce. The theory is supported by the distribution of the ending of, the ending of certain place names on Funen, uh, Lev in the northeast and Inge in the southwest, which H. V. Clausen, who lived uh, 1861 to 1937, wrote was connected with a presumed conquest originating from Zealand. Unquote. Johannes Brønsted, Politikens Danmarks Historie. A rather recent affirmation of the eastern origin of the Norseman was made by the Norwegian adventurer and explorer Thor Heyerdahl. Thor Heyerdahl is especially famous for the Kontiki expedition where he sought to prove a link between Polynesians and South America. As the last project of his life, Thor Heyerdahl sought to test the veracity of the Snorri's claim about uh, that the ancestors of the Scandinavians uh, had uh, come from areas north of the Caucasus Mountains uh, and that uh, the Asa and Baner tribes were real tribes and Odin a real person. So among other things, Thor Heyerdahl traveled to the country of Azerbaijan where he met the uh, uh, Udi tribe, or as he called them, the o Odin tribe. Uh, he believed they had kept the name uh, uh, Odin. Now the uh, Odin tribe in Azerbaijan is uh, notable because it's one of the very few ethnic groups in Azerbaijan which have remained Christians and which have not converted to uh, Islam. And uh, Thor Heyerdahl also traveled to the southern Russian city of uh, Azov on the Don River and where he made uh, archaeological digs and uh, Heyerdahl believed that uh, uh, Azov was uh, the very place where Asgard of old, which uh, Snorri wrote about, uh, it uh, had been the capital of the uh, Odin and the Asa and Vaner tribes. And uh, one of the similarities between uh, Asgard of old and uh, uh, the present Russian city of Azov is that uh, Azov uh, starts with an AZ sound, uh, just like Asgard, or well, Americans would say uh, AZ sound. Uh, and uh, in Russian, uh, the name for city or castle that is Gorot. So in Russian, uh, Asgorot or Asgard, it would uh, mean uh, the city of the uh, Asa, which is very close to, uh, similar to the name of the Israelite tribe of the uh, Asha, the city of the Asha tribe, in other words. And uh, to Heyerdahl, he uh, uh, summarized all of his findings in uh, the last book that he wrote, which he entitled uh, Jagden på Odin, uh, in English it means the, uh, the search for Odin or the hunt for Odin. So we're going to read from uh, Heyerdahl's uh, The Search for Odin. Quote, it is in a plain and simple language that Snorri Sturluson has written about Odin's northward travel from the world's old cultural centers to the northern edge of Europe. In a geographical summary which is impossible to misunderstand, Snorri first takes us from his own world in Western Europe through Gibraltar and the Mediterranean Sea to the Black Sea. 
There he places Odin in the court of the Asa on the eastern side of the border river Tana Isis Delta, where Azov is today. Then he determines the time when this event took place. It was when the Romans marched into the Caucasus area. Then we get a whole new travel route for Odin's flight, which also does not requ require any interpretation. These people were, were obviously not gods, but they were also no ordinary entourage, who set their course towards the northern part of the world when the Romans entered Turkey. With his entourage of Asa and adopted Vana, and under pressure from the invincible Romans, he starts an immigration out of the Caucasus area, which is under threat. The route went from the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea and was forced to follow the great rivers through Russia's impenetrable primeval forests. As Snorri points out, first west through Gardarike, the Viking name for Russia, either through the Black Sea coast of southern Russia and up the Dnieper, or directly up the Don, and then pulling the boats across land, which the Vikings also did later, from the southern flowing rivers of Russia to the western flowing rivers of Latvia and Estonia and into the Baltic Sea." Unquote. Thor Heyerdahl and, and Per Liljestrøm, Jagten på Odin. The lost and tribes of Israel, also known as the House of Omri, Gimiri, and Chimerians. When the ten tribes of Israel were still living in the Holy Land, they came under Assyrian domination a long time before they were deported. While still living in the land of Israel, the Assyrians referred to the northern kingdom of Israel as the House of Omri, or Bit Kumri, which is similar to the Hebrew Bet Omri. The American archaeologist E. Raymond Capt proved in the book Missing Links Discovered in Assyrian Tablets from 1985 that the Assyrians and other peoples in the Middle East called the deported Israelites by various other names such as Qumri, Chimerians, Sake, Sake and Scythians. Lots of people have already made this connection between the lost ten tribes of Israel and the Chimerians and Scythians, but E. Raymond Capt was the first one to conclusively prove this missing link. <clears throat> we, we quote, To summarize, we have observed from the Assyrian documents, that is, tablets and inscriptions, that the Israelites were called Qumri or Qumri by the Assyrians before their captivity. However, after the reign of the king of Assyria, Sargon II, who reigned 721 to 705 BC, that name is never mentioned again. Then, around 707, a people known as Gimira and Gamera are recorded as living among the Mamai. Their territory was only a few miles from the Medes, in the very areas where the scriptures state the northern ten tribe kingdom of Israel had been placed just a few years previously. We have noted that the names Gimira, Gimira, and Gamera could easily be corruptions of Qumri or Qumri, the Syrian name for the Israelites. The names uh, Sake or Saka, that is Scythians, are probably derived from Isaka or House of Isaac. It is further noted that the Assyrian name Gamira is translated into Chimerian, translation by Professor Leroy Waterman, Royal Correspondence of the Assyrian Empire, published by the University of Michigan, 1930. Although the belief based upon biblical and historical records that the Scythians and Chimerians are descendants of the lost tribes of Israel has been held by some Bible scholars for many years, archaeological evidence has been lacking. That is no longer the case. The clay cuneiform letters found in Ashurbanipal's royal library in Kijunjik are the missing links connecting the Israelites to the peoples of Western Europe and America who trace their roots to the Scythians and Chimerians. It can now truly be said archaeology has solved two great mysteries, both occurring at the same time in history. 1. What happened to the countless thousands of Israelites that disappeared into Assyrian captivity? And 2. Where did the countless thousands of Scythians and Chimerians come from? Both mysteries no longer exist. The so-called lost tribes of Israel were never really lost. They only lost their identity during the cap their captivity in Assyria. Unquote from E. Raymond Capt, Missing Links Discovered in Assyrian Tablets. 
A further piece of evidence is the Behistun stone. This is a giant inscription on a rock wall in western Iran, written by King Darius the Great of Persia, maybe around 515 BC. The Behistun stone is unique in that it is written in three different languages and therefore provide clues as to what different languages called different ethnic groups. The three languages are Babylonian, Elamite and Persian. On the inscription, the word Cana or Canaan occurs 28 times, and Armenia, where the lost ten tribes were placed, also occurs frequently. But in the Persian and uh, Elamite rendering, one ethnic group is called Saka, while in the Babylonian rendering, they are called Gimiri. This shows that the Gimiri or Chimerians and the Saka or some Scythians were one and the same people. We are going to add to this quote by E. Raymond Capt that the areas north of the Black Sea where the Chimerians were found is almost identical to the areas where Snorri Stoluson of Iceland of the 13th century he located the Asa and Vena tribes that later uh, migrated to uh, uh, Denmark and Scandinavia. And this connection between the Chimerians and the Lost Ten tribes of Israel is by no means a far-fetched theory. Theory. Uh, for example, in 1988, the Danish Assyriologist uh, Anne K. G. Christensen she published a uh, book um, uh, entitled uh, Who Were the Chimerians and Where Did They Come From? It was published by the Royal Academy of Sciences and Letters in Denmark, which is uh, the most highly esteemed uh, scientific society in Denmark. It is also sometimes attended in person by the Queen of Denmark. I know this because my father happens to be a member of it. And uh, here uh, Anne Christensen, she uh, showed uh, that uh, the Chimerians living north of the Black Sea area, they were in fact descendants of the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel. Quote, According to Herodotus and Greek tradition as a whole, the original home of the Chimerians was north of the Black Sea in what was then known as Scythia. In spite of persistent archaeological excavations, however, however, it has not been possible to determine the presence of Chimerians in Scythia or elsewhere. The question of the origin of the Chimerians therefore remains somewhat of a mystery. The author of the present investigation wishes to show with an analysis of all available contemporaneous evidence from the time of Sargon II and Esarhaddon, that is the 9th and 8th centuries BC, that the Chimerians were in fact identical with Israelites deported from northern Israel after the fall of Samaria in 722 BC. Large parts of these deportees were then posted or indeed settled in the Sacros area under Assyrian supervision and in garrisons along the frontier between Assyria and Urartu, that is Armenia, where we find them in 714." Unquote. Ancient Greek historians such as Strabo tells us that the Chimerians battled one after the other kingdom in Asia Minor until they were finally driven out of Asia Minor by Scythians sometime around 525 BC and settled in the Balkans. We have that from Iram and Kept, uh, missing links discovered in Assyrian tablets. Ancient Greek historians also indicate that some of the Scythians were forced out of the Persian Empire into what today is Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan. These Scythians were called Masagete by the Greek writers, which meant the Great Saka Horde. Most modern historians believe that the Scythians were not one ethnic group, but rather a collection of different ethnic groups which happened to inhabit the same geographical territory. We hold to this view as well. The Scythians were probably not all Israelites, but there were no doubt Israelites among the Scythians. The Chimerians, on the other hand, seemed to have been Israelites. Chimerians and Scythians become one with Germanic and Celtic peoples. In ancient times, the steppes of Eastern Europe often received invaders from Asia. All mainstream historical accounts record that when the Chimerians lived in the area north of the Black Sea, approximately 650 to 500 BC, they were driven west by the Scythians, who in turn were driven west by the Sarmatians. 
From here the descendants of the lost ten tribes of Israel, some known as Chimerians and others as Scythians, moved into areas where people speaking Germanic and Celtic languages lived and ended up taking the language of the Germanic and Celtic speaking tribes. That is why the descendants of the lost ten tribes of Israel today speak Germanic, Celtic and Romance languages. And by the way, if you, if you think that sounds far-fetched, consider that until the 1940s most Jews also spoke a Germanic language called Yiddish. Now one branch of the Chimerians migrated to Jutland. Many historians have made the connection between the Chimerians and Cimbrians of Jutland. Plutarch writes in the life of Marius they were called at the first Chimerians and then not inappropriately Cimbri. Unquote. The Stoic philosopher Poseidonus, who lived 130 to 50 BC, also records that the Cimbri, dwelling originally on the shores of the Black Sea, where they were known to the Greeks as Chimerians. Quote, Since the Nordic Cimbrians are, as I will show later, one and the same people as the Chimerians, both when it comes to their origin, name and descent, then it is safe to assume that after the first time they were driven out by the Scythians, a part of them went north and brought the Chimerian or Cimbrian name with them into the Nordic countries." Unquote. From Peter Frederik Sun, Forsøg til et udkast af en historie over folkenes oprindelse i almindelighed som en indledning til de nordiske folkes isærdelighed fra 1769. At this point in time, when Israelites, known as Chimerians and Scythians and Asa and Vaner, they mixed with the Germanic-speaking and Celtic-speaking tribes, they were a mixed people. Now the Germanic languages and the Celtic languages, they are of course a part of the Indo-European family of uh, languages, where also the Slavic languages belong, and most of the languages of India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Armenia, Greek, and the Latin languages. So the Proto-Germanic uh, tribes and the Proto-Celtic tribes, they were distinct from the uh, ten tribes of Israel, but some of them mixed and became one people. And in some areas, especially in Northern Europe, uh, along the coastlines and the islands and the peninsulas, the Hebrew elements became the dominant part while more, more uh, in the inland parts of uh, Europe, such as France and uh, southern Germany, the Indo-European elements became the dominant part. And uh, even in other parts of Europe, such as Spain, we can even detect Israelite influ influences. In the migrations of the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Dan made a more noticeable trail than the other tribes of Israel. And that was partly because that the tribe of Dan had an obsession with uh, naming uh, places after their forefather Dan. And it was partly because the tribe of Dan left the land of Israel before the other other tribes of Israel. Danites go to Greece during the Exodus. Shortly prior to the Exodus of Israel out of Egypt, some of the Danites left Egypt and went to Greece. The ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus from the 1st century BC records that a certain Israelite Danaus left Egypt for Greece around the time of the Exodus when Moses led the bulk of Israel to Canaan. This Danaus was said by ancient Greek historians to be the forefather of the Danai or Danan, another name for the Argive or Achaean Greeks who dominated the Peloponnese and led the Greek assault against Troy. But according to ancient Egyptian and Greek records, these Danai were actually Israelites. The German historian Maximilian Wolfgang Bunker, who was held in high regard when he wrote his works in the 19th century, gives a fascinating account of the exodus of Israel out of Egypt, but based on an Egyptian point of view, which he got from the Greek historian Hecatos of Abdera from Thrace from the 4th century BC. When you read this account, compare it to the book of Exodus. It sounds exactly like how the Egyptians would have written the history of the Exodus. We quote, 
The narrative of Hecatos of Abdera, who was in Egypt in the time of Ptolemy I and wrote an Egyptian history, gives us the most unprejudiced account composed from the widest point of view and connects the immigration of the Hebrews, whom he does not consider Egyptians, Egyptians with a supposed immigration from Egypt to Greece. Hecatos says, quote, Once when a pestilence had broken out in Egypt, the cause of the visitation was generally ascribed to the anger of the gods. As many strangers dwelt in Egypt and observed different customs in religion and sacrifice, it came to pass that the her hereditary worship of the gods was being given up in Egypt. The Egyptians, therefore, were of opinion that they would obtain no alleviation of the evil unless they removed the people of foreign extraction. When they were driven out, the noblest and bravest part of them, as some say, under noble and renowned leaders, Danaus and Cadmus, came to Hellas, that is Greece. But the great bulk of them migrated into the land not far rem removed from Egypt, which is now called Judea. These emigrants were led by Moses, who was the most distinguished among them for wisdom and bravery." Unquote. Wolfgang Maximilian Bunker, History of Antiquity. Hecatos of Abdera was a historian from Thrace in northern Greece who lived in Egypt during the 4th century BC under the Macedonian King Ptolemy I, one of Alexander the Great's generals. As we have just re read in the extract above, it is quite obvious that the Israelites who Moses led to Canaan and the Danai who went to Greece were the same people and that the Danai were in fact Israelite Danites. Another marvelous account, which is also seen through Egyptian eyes and therefore gives greater credence to its veracity because it cannot be accused of being Christian or Jewish propaganda, is that of Lysimachus of Alexandria, 355 to 281 BC, whose history was preserved by Flavius Josephus in Contra Apionem, and we quote. At the time of King Bokoris, which is possibly the Greek name for the pharaoh of the Exodus, so at the time of King Bokoris, unclean and leprous men had come into the temples to beg for food. Hence there was a blight on the land, and Bokoris received a response from Ammon, that would be an Egyptian god, that the temples must be purified. The lepers, as if the sun were angry at their existence, were to be plunged into the sea, and the unclean were to be driven out of the land. Hence the lepers were thrown into the sea, but the unclean were driven out helpless into the desert. These met together in council. In the night, in the night they lit fires and lights and called, fasting, upon the gods to save them. Then a certain Moses advised them to go through the desert. Till they came to inhabited regions, they established a city, Jerusalem, in Judea." Unquote. The Greek historians we have just quoted provide evidence that the Exodus went not only to Canaan but also to Greece and that the, that the tribe of Dan led the latter. And we have this information from an article by Jory Stephen Brooks, The Forgotten History of the Danite Exodus from Egypt. The Greek Danai or Danan. Danaos became the forefather of the Greek tribe called Danai or Danan, which dominated most of the Peloponnese Peninsula. For example, in the Iliad, Homer simply re refers to the Greeks who attacked Troy in the 12th century BC as Danai. The primary cities of these Greek Danai or Danoi were Mycenae, Argos and Tyrans in the northeastern Peloponnese and later Sparta in the southern Peloponnese. The Greek Danai or Danan or Danoi also settled in the Black Sea. The most famous of these was Jason and the Argonauts who settled in Colchis, a kingdom in what today is now western Georgia in the Caucasus Mountains. Dan's connection with Phoenicians. The tribe of Dan lived right next to the Phoenicians, a Canaanite merchant people who lived in and around modern Lebanon and who were excellent sailors. It is no big mystery that Dan also had close connection with the Phoenicians. When Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, the king of Tyre, for example, sent a skilled ma master artisan to help him, who was the son of a man of Tyre and a woman of Dan. 2 Chronicles 2, 14. 
During the time of the judges, approximately 1285 BC, the Israelites Deborah and Barak defeated a Canaanite occupation army, but complained that the Danites did not help them, moaning, quote, Why did Dan remain in ships? Unquote. Judges chapter 5, verse 17. This was despite the fact that, that neither of Dan's two territories in Israel had any coastal areas. This was because the Danites were working close with the Phoenicians. When the Assyrians first made the northern kingdom of Israel a vassal state under King Yehu of Israel in the middle of the 800s BC, and later invaded and deported all the ten tribes around 721 BC, Dan was the first of the twelve tribes to feel the Assyrian onslaught because Dan was the most northern tribe. It is therefore easy to imagine that many Danites fled to escape the Assyrians. The easiest way to do so was to go to neighboring Phoenician states of Tyre and Sidon, whose ships traveled far and wide. It was thus easier for the Danites to escape from the Assyrians than it was for the other Israelite tribes. These Danites traveled by sea to Greece, where they joined their tribesmen, the Greek Danai, before they continued their migration to Ireland. Dan in Ireland. Ancient Irish history speaks of two tribes which conquered Ireland. Both the Annals of Ireland by the Four Masters from 1636, a work based on much older material, and Geoffrey Keating's History of Ireland from 1634, says that a people called the Tuatha de Danann, meaning the tribe of the Danann, conquered Ireland around 1200 BC. Around 1000 BC, another people, the Miletians, arrived and became the masters of Ireland. The Tuatha de Danann and the Miletians were of the same people because when the Miletians arrived, they were able to communicate with the Tuatha de Danann in their own language. According to the Annals of Ireland by the Four Masters, the Tuatha de Danann had lived a long time in Greece and had been, and had been working close with the Phoenicians. According to Geoffrey Keating, the Miletians were also called Scots because they had lived in Scythia, the area north of the Black Sea, for 150 years after they left their homeland. After the Miletians, or Scots, left Scythia, they continued to Greece and then to Spain and finally to Ireland. It was from these Miletians, or Scots, that Ireland got its ancient name Scotia. The Romans also called Ireland Scotia. It was only in the 9th century AD that the name Scotia was applied to the northern part of the island of Great Britain, which we today call Scotland. A Spanish priest, Joaquin Villanueva, even wrote a book entitled Phoenician Island from 1837, where he sought to prove that the Tuatha de Danann and the Irish in general were of Phoenician origin. In this book, he wrote that the ancestors of the Irish were the people of the city of Dan, where they worshipped the graven image given to them by Micah, and where King Jeroboam of Israel set up a golden calf. These references are from the Book of Judges and are about the tribe of Dan and not about Phoenicians. And we have this information from uh, John Cox Scholar's book, Dan the Pioneer of Israel. Dan in Scotland. In 1320, Scottish nobles tried to secede from English rule and signed a Declaration of Independence, which they sent to the Pope in Rome. This declaration is called the Declaration of Arbroath. In this, the Scottish noblemen, led by Robert the Bruce, wrote that the ancestors of the Scots had come from Scythia, we read, quote, Most Holy Father and Lord, we know, and from the chronicles and books of the ancients, we find that among other famous nations, our own, the Scots, has been graced with widespread renown. They journeyed from Greater Scythia by the way of the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Pillars of Hercules, and dwelt for a long course of time in Spain among the most savage, savage tribes. But nowhere could they be subdued by any race, however barbarous. Thence they came, 1200 years after the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea, to their home in the west, where they still live today." Unquote. And we have this from E. Raymond Capt, the Scottish Declaration of Independence. A curious side note to this is from the US and World News Report 
from her 1987 reporting about the St. Patrick's Day Parade. When the then mayor of New York City, Jewish Ed Koch, was asked about why he participated, the newspaper noted that Mayor Koch, we quote, explained his presence at the head of the Grand Parade thusly, quote, it's part of my roots. The ten lost tribes of Israel, we believe, ended up in Ireland, unquote. So this is the end of part one of the lost ten tribes of Israel in Europe. And in part two, we are going to uh, look at uh, Bible prophecies concerning the lost ten tribes of Israel and the uh, DNA and the uh, physical appearance of the lost ten tribes and the uh, linguistics and uh, a comparison between the uh, Semitic uh, script and the runes, the alphabet of the uh, ancient Scandinavia.